My name is Temple Brandon. I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Great. Thanks so much. How was the drive up today? It was beautiful, but there was a bit of blowing snow, and I want to get past the blowy snow part before it gets really dark. Yeah. Because yeah. I find blowing snow at night really scary. I do too. You're not alone. I think a lot of us do. Um, you're here today to talk about animal handling, and you've spent much of your life um, advocating for the humane treatment of livestock. And a great many of the animals that go to slaughter now actually pass through facilities that you've helped design or had some influence over. Um, and I wonder if you think back to sort of the first animal processing centers that you saw before you became so influential, how has that changed? How has the treatment of animals changed since then? Oh, the handling of cattle has greatly improved. When I started out in the 70s and the 80s, uh, there were a lot of places that just were terrible the way they treated animals, just electric prod everything. And people are really starting to get interested in low-stress handling, seeing the benefits for employee safety, for um, animal weight gain. Cattle get really excited when you handle them, gain less weight, lower immune function, you know, they'll be uh, less likely to get sick if you handle them quietly. One of the things we need to be working on is is working with cattle so we're not always forcing them to do things. Like for example, you have uh, heifers you're going to keep, well then take those heifer calves and just walk them through the squeeze chute and then maybe feed them some uh, cubes or some uh, treat. And it's going to take a little extra time to do this, but then they're going to be so much easier to work when they grow up. Because it's very important that an animal's first experience with something new, like the corrals, be a good first experience. Let's bring them in and feed them, walk through the chute, nothing bad happens. Uh, also, people need to recognize all the little distractions that the animals are afraid of, like a coat on a fence, a chain hanging down, a reflection on a puddle. Now, I realize you can't get rid of every shadow, but I want to make you get aware of that. So if the animal stops right where there's a shadow, give, it the, give the leader a chance to stop, put the head down, take a look, and then when the leader goes, the other cattle will follow. But if you just push them up there into that shadow, they're going to block and they're going to turn back on them. And if there's chains hanging down, then get rid of them. I've been talking about chains hanging down in facilities for 35 years, and I still got to talk about them because people don't take them out. It's little sensory detail that people tend to not notice. They'll stop where there's a change in flooring, and you go from a dirt floor to a concrete floor. <coughs> or they don't want to get on the truck. Well, you can take some of the bedding that's on the truck and, and sprinkle it around on the loading ramp so that you have less of a change from one type of floor to another. You've described yourself many times as a visual thinker, that that's part of your autism. How does that help you when you're envisioning these kinds of facilities and how to improve them? Because I think about it completely visually. Somebody starts telling me they're having a problem with the cattle, they, can ex they explain it to me in detail, and then start to see a picture of it. It's not abstract. It, it, it's sensory-based. I mean, cattle, of course, think in pictures. They think in sounds. There are animals that can get terrified of a particular sound. They'll know the sound of the good person's voice and the bad person's voice. They can recognize the sound of the truck that brings the feed and maybe a truck that might be associated with something bad. They'll differentiate those sounds. So that heightened sensory experience is something that you've had to deal with a lot as well. Um, how do you manage that and what, what is that still like day to day? Well, there's two things. I'm a sensory-based thinker, but some people on the autism spectrum have problems with sound sensitivity. They have problems with sensitivity of things like the flicker of a, the 60 cycle electricity in, uh, in fluorescent lights. And as we move towards uh, getting rid of the old fashioned hot energy waster bulbs, there's going to be some real problems with lighting. Not just for people with autism, but some people that are ADHD, some people that are labeled learning problems, some people that are labeled dyslexic. Um, they're going to see the room flickering like a discotheque, flickering like a strobe light. Now, I don't have this problem. But I've had students that have had these problems. And this is going to be one of the big, a uh, very serious problem for a lot of people. And hopefully in the future the lighting technologies will get developed that do not have this problem. But I can tell you right now, if you've got this problem, I'd be hoarding 100 watt light bulbs right now. One of the things that you've talked about a lot in terms of your autism is the fact that um, interacting socially, you said that you sort of learned how to be socially like being in a play. And I wonder if you can describe that a little bit, I mean, what it's sort of like for you. Well, I don't pick up subtle social cues. I was just out at a talk just last week, and they made some joke, and I thought it was something serious. Uh, this particular theater that I was in had a setup where um, uh, the energy saving system would turn off a bunch of the lights in the hall, and uh, we had to run the bookstore with a 
lights off in the hall, and somebody said, oh, it's a union thing. And I actually believed that, you know, where actually it was a thing where somebody didn't punch the right button on the computerized uh, energy saving system. And that was last week. I just didn't, um, I didn't pick up on that. And there's other situations where, yeah, I realized it was a joke. But, you know, see, that's something that actually is plausible. Because there are theaters where it is a union thing and you can't touch the lighting controls. So these are all things you've learned. I sort of wonder what that's like in the context of an interview like this one. Um, you know, what, what kinds of things are you having to even make note of? Or is this just so habitual that it's not difficult anymore? Well, I've learned that, you know, I find people want to ask about autism. Uh, you know, you learn how to act in different situations. And I've had people ask me if I could snap my fingers and not be autistic, would I do it? I'd say no, because I like the logical way that I think. See, the way my thinking works, and this is really good for a lot of kind of problem solving, it's bottom up. You take all the little detailed pieces and you put all the details together to form the theory rather than being top down. Everything, I, to understand uh, something, if we were looking at an issue like healthcare, for example, I'd look at it, well, if I made this policy, what would it do to this person over here, this hotel maid working in the hotel? What would it do to this person over here? I, it's not abstract for me. And how do you view the way that people think? Very vague and imprecise and illogical. And I, I, we're going to need some logical thinking to solve some of the problems that our country's in right now today. And I, hopefully we're going to get some people that are going to do that. And one thing I'm very concerned about is so many schools have taken out the hands-on classes. You know, the art class, the sewing class, wood shop, uh, welding shop, auto shop. Because these are the classes where I excel. If I hadn't had these kind of classes when I was young, I would have gone nowhere. It was the only thing in school that I liked. And it was my science teacher that got me turned around. And I was really happy. As I was uh, cutting through the education building to get over here from the parking lot, I ran into a, an older person that's actually gone back to school so he can become a science teacher. And I think that's really, really good. So you've also talked about, in terms of growing up, that you really benefited from having a sort of strict, I think, 1950s upbringing. You described it. And I wonder how you think of that as valuable. I think my 50s upbringing was really valuable because we had sit-down meals. You had to have manners. You had to say please and thank you. Then I'd go over to Granny's and we'd have a really formal Sunday dinner. And, and you had to learn how to take turns talking. Like if I monopolized the conversation, Mother would say, well, give your father a chance to talk or give your brother a chance to talk. It was, um, that's a 50s upbringing. And the thing is, every kid was brought up that way. I go over to the Woods house or the Culver's house, the same kind of rules were there. In fact, at the Culver's, they were even more strict than you know, my mother was. And you see, if you have to learn social skills like being in a play, that 50s upbringing teaches you how to be in the play. And I think a lot of kids today where there's sort of a more looser kind of uh, upbringing, it really hurts them. See, autism is a continuum. Geeks and nerds and mild autism are the same thing. Half the people that work in Silicon Valley would have a very, very mild form of autism. You know, you get a few social circuits disconnected, and then you've got geek circuits to do things like programming. And then at the other end of the autism spectrum, you've got somebody that's very, very severely handicapped. Is going to be nonverbal. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of early educational intervention where a uh, kid's two to three years old, there's no speech, he's rocking, he's got all these odd kind of behaviors. What you need to be doing is working 20 or 30 hours with that kid, just keeping them engaged. I mean, the worst thing you can do is to just do uh, nothing at all with them. You know, just let them sit in the corner and rock. That, don't do that. Get some grandmothers, get somebody, get working with them now. You're constantly asked to explain autism. Um, obviously, it's a role that you've taken on pretty willingly, but I wonder if you ever have any misgivings about that. Well, I think it's really important to get people to uh, understand. The other thing I talk about in my autism talks is different kinds of thinking. You get on the higher end of the autism spectrum, you'll have a kid that's brilliant in one area and learning disabled in another area. Like, I am a photorealistic visual thinker. When I think of things, it comes up to me in specific visual images. But I can't do algebra. And one of the mistakes that was made with me is that I wasn't allowed to go on to geometry and trick. But I'm finding a lot of students and I'm finding a lot of adults that come up to me at conferences and say, I was one of those kids, I failed algebra, but geometry and trig I did just fine. And, you know, for the visual thinker, algebra is not the prerequisite for geometry. 
because you can solve mathematical things visually or solve it uh, more, more verbally. Then there's the pattern thinker. This is a more abstract visual thinking. Think origami, chess, organic chemistry molecules. These are the people that are going to be good at computer programming, engineering, figuring out all the stresses and strains on concrete and bridge supports. But this kid may have trouble with reading. This is where these kids often have a problem. I learned reading just, you know, with phonics, you know, like the simple kind of, real simple kind of phonics. You know, it kind of works uh, most of the time, but it doesn't always work. You know, I've been learning about some other ways of teaching phonics where it's like over 100 rules, very, very specifically, that work on about 98, 98% of uh, English words, and that would really appeal to the, um, sort of the mathematical thinker. Then there's some kids where they cite words is the best way that they learn. I have seen kids that have been ruined by jamming the phonics down their throats. See, the thing is, is that there's different kinds of lines. Then some are verbal thinkers, and their math abilities are just average. But they're really good at uh, doing jobs like journalism, technical writing. I've been interviewed by people that I know are on the spectrum. One of the things we've got to do with a lot of kids, especially the ones that are kind of quirky and different, is we've got to teach work skills. When I was 13, I did a little sewing job two afternoons a week. When I was 15, I took care of nine horses. I think it's a shame that so many places the paper routes are gone because I think kids need to be learning those work skills. Yeah, you got to be there every day doing it. When I was in college, I did different internships. I'm always just telling all the regular students, you know, do internships relevant to your career while you're in college. You've got to develop these work skills. Temple Grandin, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. So anything I missed, anything that you'd like well, to Well, I might want to mention a few books. Can I do that? <laughs> do you want, I mean, well, I, I just want to mention if they're interested, you know, in autism, like read these yeah. books and livestock these books. Right, exactly. Um, generally what we do is when we write an intro and write a back announce, that's All the right. information. Yeah, well, the do. books that would be the most important would be Thinking in Pictures, right. and then for animal issues. What are you recording on? Second. Okay. The books that probably be most important for people interested in autism it would be thinking in pictures, and then the other book is The Way I See It. And then if you're interested in livestock, I have a book called Humane Livestock Handling, that's strictly on cattle handling. I have a book called uh, Animals Make Us Human, where I actually talk about a lot of animal issues. And Animals in Translation, which is just a general animal behavior book that will help you with all kinds of animals.